Well, welcome everyone. I'm calling this regular meeting of the King County Regional Homeless Governing Committee to order. Um, I am filling in as an alternate for Jonathan Hemphill, who isn't feeling well and will not will not be able to be here today. We will conduct this meeting via Zoom. All attendees will this meeting is being recorded. All visual, verbal, and written comments are public record. Board members to ask questions or share a comment, please raise your hand by clicking the button on the right side of your screen and you will be entered into a queue. When discussions formally begin, I will call on you in the order in which you raise your hand. After your turn, you can raise your hand again to be entered back into the queue. All right, so we will start now with our theory of change. Our three theory of change for the King County Regional Homeless Authority is if we create a homeless response system that centers customer voice, then we will be able to focus on meeting needs and eliminating inequities in order to end homelessness for all. Our land acknowledgement is something that is also very, very important. We want to acknowledge that we currently sit upon occupied land of the Duwamish people. Let it also be known that for nearly half a thousand years, these people and other First Nation people have endured and continue to fight for their sovereignty and against societal ills that stem from that occupation. I would also like to acknowledge the labor of enslaved African-Americans, Latinx, Chinese populations um, who also built this country. Naomi, can you please conduct roll call? Yes, thank you, Lamont. Dow Constantine. Here. Joe McDermott. Here. Claudia Balducci. Here. Lamont Green as an alternate for Jonathan Hemphill. Here. Kirk McLean. Here. Zanita Reed. Angela Burney. Here. Ed Prince. Here. Nancy Backus. Here. Andrew Lewis. Present. Bruce Harrell. Lisa Herbold. Here. We do have a quorum with 10 members and one alternate present. Thank you, Lamont. Excellent. Thank you, Naomi. Um, so now we move to the consent agenda um, to approve um, our agenda items. Um, so do we have a motion? Mr. Chair, may I briefly yes. interrupt? I apologize. I just received a uh, word from Mayor Harold that he is on his way and I wanted to let everyone know that he is having a technical issue but will be here shortly. Thank you, thank you, Mark. All right. So do we have a motion uh, regarding our consent agenda? Mr. Chair, uh, Member Backus, I move to approve the consent items. Thank you, Mayor Backus. And do we have a second? Zanita Reed seconds. Thank you, Zanita. Any discussion, questions, concerns? All right. All in favor of approving, please say yay. Aye. Yay. Aye. 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 Yay. Yay. Any nays? Any abstentions? All right. So now we're going to move to our public comment, and we will have 10 minutes for public comment. If you wish to comment and have not already typed your name and, and uh, city in the chat box, please do so now. Each individual will be given ten, two minutes to comment and will be unmuted and called on in the order that their names were entered into the chat. When you reach the end of the two minutes, we will ask you to finish your comments so that others may have an opportunity to speak. Uh, welcome, Mayor Harrell. Thanks for also, welcoming. Yes. I will close public comment um, approximately 10 minutes from now. And so public comment is open. Mont, at this time, we have uh, one person who would like to comment. 
Red, or two. Um, the first one is Reverend Bill Curlin Hackett from Auburn, Washington. Bill, you should be unmuted at this time. Our governing committee members and staff of RHA, thank you uh, for this chance to comment. Uh, I comment today on the formation of the Vehicle Residency Work Group under RHA late in 2021 and some of its work that relates to your work governing here and in your own settings. As a work group, we sent a letter regarding severe weather response that we hoped reached all sectors attaching to the regional authority, including each of you. Recommendations we made largely had to do with responses to those living in vehicles. We asked that any potentially harmful parking enforcement toward lived in vehicles on right of ways be suspended and that some indoor safe sites would include a place to park. We've also recommended that all weather and unsafe condition events become annualized collaborative efforts regionally. In other words, we do not want to be surprised or caught off guard where any unsheltered homeless face harm. And as HUD defines them, both the 50% of the unsheltered in vehicles and the other half in all other settings. We hope to take this one step further in our ongoing mutual work. That is, that you would examine laws and other violations in your jurisdictions that bring harm to vehicle residents and make this common work harder for all of us. Every jurisdiction has some of those be it added cost for tabs, rules on how often a lived-in vehicle must move and ticketing attaching to that, jurisdictions ignoring the illegal blockage of right-of-ways by the private sector's placement of ecology barriers and so on. In Seattle, I've led a team to mitigate the Scofflaw Ordinance, which as Mayor Harrell well remembers, we have also sought to amend every year since 2011, solely to protect the indigent. And so far it's been to no avail, but we'll keep trying. So we are paid in part to mitigate a law by those who passed it. Such laws must include provisions for helping the indigent and accompanying outreach, provisions that in time can sunset when the work we are called to do together has resolved such needs. Your support towards these realities is critical and without changes, we'll fight against ourselves and further harm those for whom we gather. We're here to help and uh, help us help others, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Hackett, for your work. Thank you. And I believe next we have uh, Nora Phillips White from Seattle. Nora, at this time, you should be unmuted. And Nora, can you hear us? And you just, if you hit your unmute button there. Nora, if you are on your phone, you will have to press star. Um, I think it's six. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Nora. Hi. My name is Nora Phillips-White and I live in the Lake City neighborhood of Seattle and work as a clinical social worker in the emergency department at Swedish First Hill. I am here to express concern that emergency and crisis services for our homeless patients in the ERs, which have always been limited, seem to be evaporating. I support the move towards enhanced shelters to provide residents with more privacy, comfort, and dignity, but the transition to shelters that require referrals from community-based agencies means that patients who come to the ER and critically need shelter have very few options. Outside of severe weather events, walk-in shelters have become very limited, and when I call to check on beds after 8 p.m. or so, they are almost always full. As I'm sure you know, it's nearly impossible to get a bed in domestic violence shelters the same day. It takes weeks of planning for people experiencing domestic violence to find a safe place to, st to stay so they can leave life-threatening living conditions. Hospital diversion programs like the crisis diversion facility can be so valuable in helping our patients with behavioral health concerns connect to community resources to stabilize outside the hospital. But CDF was already underfunded and understaffed and with COVID, their capacity keeps getting cut back. It's not uncommon for a patient in RAD to wait for more than 24 hours for a bed there. Even from CDF, many people are unlikely to get fully connected to the supports they need because community-based behavioral health providers are spread so thin. I see how many people are falling through the cracks due to lack of capacity in our social services. 
For many patients, all I can do is get them an intake and maybe in weeks or months, if they are able to consistently show up for meetings with a case manager and meet the right criteria to be prioritized for housing, they might get into an enhanced shelter. Lack of safe housing is an emergency, but we don't have the resources to treat it on an emergency basis. To address the homelessness crisis in our region, I believe we need to be increasing and expediting the pathways to shelter that provide safety, dignity, and care that people need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora, for your comments and, and for the work that you're doing, especially during these COVID times. Thank you. Next, we have Adam Fulton from Seattle. Hi, can you all hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Adam. Okay. Hi, my name is Adam Fulton. I am a social worker at the Swedish First Cell Emergency Department. I work nights there in the ED. Um, some of our growing concerns that we are seeing is lack of access to our outside services as far as enhanced shelters and clinicians that can actually handle the caseload that we are seeing and sending to them. <clears throat> we do handle a small population of Seattle's homeless and people in need, but we are seeing an increased number, especially as COVID increases and the lack of capacity due to that is playing a big part in circles being closed for them and access to services being closed to them, as well as access to services that we can utilize in the emergency department are small and slim and really difficult to work with to help our clients and the people in the most need, especially during cold times of the, the season. We are advocating that we actually have more access to clinicians outside of the, the hospital that can help as well as long as as well as housing case managers increase as well as increasing their pay to actually make it a feasible and reasonable job to have and hold so that they can support themselves and their families as well and that is what i am advocating for right now thank you thank you so much adam uh, for your work and for and for coming and sharing at public comment do we have any other uh folks for uh public comment at this time, I do not see anyone else who would like to provide public comment. All right. Um, so we will um, close public comment um, for anyone who would have liked to share but did not have an opportunity um, to provide comment. Uh, we will leave the chat window open uh, uh, for the next uh, four minutes. All right. So now we are going to move to our CEO updates. Um, and I'll turn it over to Mark Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, it was like very formal. Uh, Naomi, can you please mute and remove our public commenter? Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, and a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, the uh, my report is relatively brief. Um, in keeping with that this is a special meeting and we're very grateful for your time, but just wanna give you uh, a quick update on where we are. So uh, in our first um, nine months, which was uh, for 2021, uh, we went from one person who was me uh, and now we are as of today, uh, 32 people uh, and still growing. Um, our grants and contracts management systems are up and running. Um, that was a really significant feat um, uh, with a uh, full scale implementation um, led by some uh, exceptional staff here that we are fortunate to have. Um, the, uh, all the providers have received master service agreements and then project service agreements. Um, the master service agreement will govern all of their activity with the authority um, and the project service agreements. You know, some providers do one thing, others do many. Uh, and so we've set up PSA specific to those uh, activities. Um, one impact of, of COVID uh, is that the uh, providers have requested and we have granted an extension on the execution of those PSAs. Um, right now, uh, as you uh, just heard in public comment, people are maxed um, and uh, we are attempting to allow folks to redirect their energy towards uh, saving lives and keeping people safe. Um, our first budget cycle, as you will hear, um, has about 66% of funding from the city of Seattle and about 34% from King County. Uh, and uh, we will get into more detail on uh, the exact numbers momentarily. 
Um, our sub-regional planning staff have been working across the county uh, and with uh, all of our jurisdictions in order to uh, understand the specific and unique dynamics folks face um, and to begin to build out uh, tailored uh, and specific plans in all of those communities in collaboration uh, with all of the relevant stakeholders that then roll up into a regional agenda. Um, we have partnered with uh, over 200 organizations um, to map out the services and the gaps um, that fit each of those seven unique subregions. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about that work and, and very grateful to Alexis and her team for uh, how they have uh, stepped in there. Um, just uh, in terms of uh, briefly uh, on uh, the staff itself. Um, so we just conducted our first sort of hiring pulse to understand the baseline in terms of how folks identify so that we can uh, map towards uh, equitable hiring in the future and uh, look for any attrition rates that signal that we are not doing right by any uh, particular group or subgroups. Um, as of uh, today, we have about an 80, 7% response rate on that pulse. Um, and uh, folks are about 61% of the agency identifies as uh, a person of color. Um, we have uh, about 60% of the staff that identify as women, 42% uh, identify as LGBTQ. Um, we have uh, about 5% that identify as trans. Uh, and 50% uh, of the staff identifies as folks who have lived experience of homelessness, uh, the criminal legal system, or the mental health system. Um, I, uh, I feel really good about that, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, being able to lean into the values that we set in terms of, you know, who is doing this work, um, not just in terms of, you know, the seats for the Lived Experience Coalition on the Implementation Board and the Governing Committee, but also inclusive of our, our staff here at the Authority uh, feels really important. And we really try to hold those values through our hiring process and through our recruitment efforts. Um, and it is, um, it's good to see them paying off. Um, the last thing I'll just say briefly is um, in partnership with King County and DCHS and uh, Director Floor and his team, um, we were able to conduct um, a uh, cross uh, administrative data set analysis that revealed a uh, much higher number of folks experiencing homelessness in the county than had previously been reported. Um, the uh, prior reports based largely on the point in time count, uh, otherwise known as the one night count, um, consistently index the number somewhere between 11 and uh, 15, sometimes 20,000, depending on the analysis. Um, we always knew that was an undercount and uh, grateful to the PME team. And again, uh, Director Floor, um, what we see now is that in 2019, there were about 45,000 people who experienced homelessness in the county. And in uh, 2020, we saw that number at about 40,000. We will be indexing against the 45,000 number for now. We believe that in 2020, due to COVID, um, there were fewer touch points for people with the various uh, programs that normally would have seen them. Um, and so we don't actually think that's a, a declension so much as like, you know, we uh, de-intensified shelter settings, we, you know, shuttered some day centers, et cetera. Um, we will be, uh, uh, moving forward with a qualitative research engagement with our unsheltered neighbors in March um, that will focus on better understanding uh, what needs folks have and where our system is not meeting those needs uh, to get people uh, on pathways to come inside. Um, and then uh, continuing with our data push, we will uh, you know, be focused on the development of a regional by name list. Um, and then of course, the, the big work of a, a full scale uh, system redesign and rebid for 23. Um, and that process will begin uh, this quarter uh, and conclude probably uh, in June. And we look forward to being able to brief you along the way uh, at your quarterly meetings and uh, any other opportunities that you would like. Um, and that concludes my CEO report. Thank you, Mark, for the amazing work of, your, of you and your team. Um, now we're gonna open it up for any questions or comments. Um, from the board. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I have a, a question if it'd be appropriate at this time. Please. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Mark, first, I, you know, it was great to hear from you yesterday at the Regional Policy Committee and, and said, oh, first off, uh, Andrew Lewis, Councilmember City of Seattle for the viewing public. Uh, but it was good to uh, hear from you at the Regional Policy Committee yesterday um, on the report on the snow response and some of the other activities you've, you've been doing. And I really appreciate your leadership in that really challenging time, as I said in yesterday's meeting, but I'll say it again today. Um, just the, the ability to adapt and scramble to, to get something done made a massive difference and uh, under really trying circumstances and really appreciate you leading by example and even taking on um, a supervisory shift in a, um, uh, in a shelter at a certain um, stage due to staffing shortages and, and that kind of servant leadership is really appreciated. So um, really appreciate you taking that on. Um, one of the things we talked about yesterday, and I subsequently had a chance to talk to um, Nigel Herbig, the ex external um, or intergovernmental relations uh, point person in the authority, um, about some activity the board might take toward the governor's budget or supporting the governor's budget and the, the 800 million or so dollars the governor has proposed in this session. Um, to go toward alleviating these issues around homelessness that we we talk about uh, as a uh, as a body, and I think it would send a really strong message given the diversity of representatives on this board of suburban jurisdictions, county jurisdictions, city of Seattle. Um, if the bo governing board were to send a joint um, letter uh, to the legislature endorsing um, that budget and really send a message that. Um, we welcome that kind of investment and partnership in the work that we're doing um, and just wanted to bring that recommendation today as a, as a question to your report about whether, um, you know, as a director, you think that would be advisable and, and I'm happy to take a, a role on in kind of coordinating and putting a communication like that together, uh, given that that significant resource is going to help all of us um, uh, get the work we have a shared commitment to done uh, and it might be a good way for us to assert um, uh, um, our influence in that process so I just wanted to throw that out there for your feedback um, uh, and again just lift up uh, you know that we're excited to kind of kick things off here by approving your first budget and hopefully if we have that cooperation from the state we're going to be in a position to, to uh, approve um, bigger and more robust budgets uh, going forward for your work uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, I uh, wholeheartedly support that idea. Uh, and if uh, this body chooses to take it up, my team is happy to coordinate. I think, you know, we are particularly interested in the Apple Health and Homes Act, as it is, uh, I think, currently being referred to, um, which has significant um, funding for uh, acquisition and development of uh, permanent supportive housing, about 500 million uh, allocated from state ARPA funds, um, which uh, we we would be deeply supportive of. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, you know, there are some other really interesting, and I can take this offline with anyone who wants to wonk out with me, there are some really interesting things involved um, in uh, the proposal around the 1115 waiver uh, and foundational community supports, a Medicaid reimbursable uh, stream of funding that many of you know I have talked about, I think is underutilized in the homelessness space. Um, and uh, this act could potentially cement that connection in a really positive way. Um, additionally, I think that there is still some ongoing conversation about how uh, aggressively to target the uh, Apple Health and Homes Act towards some of our most vulnerable citizens. And so uh, I apologize, not citizens, residents. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, to that end, um, I think it would be good for us to weigh in and say that we need to target it, right? That like, if we, if we don't target it towards the folks who need it the most, it won't have the impact that folks want it to have. So happy to support that effort if folks are interested. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis, for raising that up, and Mark for your response. Any other comments, questions uh, from the board regarding CEO updates? All right. So we will shift to the to the very big item, uh, and here the 2022 final budget presentation, and this is a voting item. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, Mark Jones and Meg Barclay for that presentation. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome Meg Barclay, our Chief Administrative Officer. Hi, and actually, uh, Tiffany Brooks, our Finance Director, is going to do the presentation this time. So I think she's... Brett. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share my screen and turn off my camera because I will be looking at a different screen while I present to you. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Well, good, morning. good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, we are presenting the budget, 2022 budget um, that we have been awarded and approved through our MSAs through the city and county, city of Seattle and the King County. So we will get started here and let me make sure this is working. There we go. Okay, so as of January 12th, yesterday, actions were taken by the Implementation Board to approve our King County Regional Homeless Authority 2022 final budget. And the action items today for you guys, the governing committee, will be for you to approve the action that was taken by the Implementation Board, which is approving the 2022 final budget, and it will require a two thirds vote. As you've seen previously in this uh, presentation, there are minor updates. Um, so I will highlight any updates that were made to this presentation from when you viewed it previously. Um, so for this slide, we do have 69%, 69.1% of our funding will be going toward continued programs that we are receiving from King County and from the city of Seattle. 23.49% of our funding um, will be for new programs and is consistent of other funding sources. And 7.53% of our budget will go towards operating and administration. This is a breakdown of our budget. Um, as I said before, um, we have a similar, similar slides as previously, and we did revise some of the lines. So they are highlighted in red so that you can see the difference from your previous uh, presentation compared to today's presentation. The first portion of this um, slide is for continued programs. Uh, these stay the same. We will be um, contracting and are in the process, as Mark mentioned earlier, of sending out PSAs and having our agencies um, complete their MS PSAs and their budgets, and they will get those back to us this month. Um, these will be for continued programs from both the city and the county without any changes or deviations from their previous contracts with both entities. And so it will remain the same in 2022. The next section is for new programs and other funding. The first line has been revised. It was a little bit higher or well, a lot higher previously when we presented it to you guys, but we decided to um, sort them out and break them out a little differently so that you can see the different fund sources that are coming from the different um, agencies or jurisdictions. So in this case right here, we do have the city of Seattle um, council budget actions. This is for $1.5 million. The next line is for ESG CV. Um, these are one-time COVID uh, CARES Act dollars. This line was revised. It was approximately $1.1 million. And we increased it now that we have our signed and executed MSA from the city of Seattle, which includes carry forward dollars from the ESG CV grant that they received. It also included the CDBG CV COVID funds as well. This was not included previously in our slide deck because we were not aware that we were receiving these dollars um, this quickly. Uh, we were expecting to receive them a little bit later um, in the year uh, after they closed out and closed out all of their contracts, but we ended up receiving these dollars in our MSA. So we are very um, grateful for these dollars. It's 2.9 million. The next line is for the coronavirus state local fiscal recovery funds, also known as Clifford dollars from the city of Seattle. These dollars were also um, revised. They were previously included in the top line with the council budget actions, but we separated it out so that we can see the fund source and the dollar amount for that fund source. These dollars um, will be broken down a little bit later in the next slide um, to show how they are related to the council uh, budget actions. And then we are extremely grateful as well during the severe weather event that we had just recently, we received a United Way Severe Weather and COVID Response Grant for $50,000. And that's been included here now that we have an executed agreement with them as well. 
Uh, the following section is for our operating costs. Um, it is for $11.9 million. This line did increase and we are very appreciative um, from all of our partners and the city of Seattle for helping us close the funding gap that we had in our operating costs. And so this is increased by that as well as some additional administrative costs that we anticipate to be associated with administering the Clifford dollars. This slide was presented previously and it has not changed. It is identifying the projects and the contracts that are coming over or that did come over, excuse me, um, this year from the city of Seattle and from King County, and then showing the total amount that we um, received in contracts. Um, I believe Mark mentioned previously that um, within our contracting process, we did combine some of these contracts into one contract for our providers so that they do not have multiple contracts for the same project. And this slide is for our operations cost. Um, it is pretty much the same with the addition of the dollars that we received from the city of Seattle to increase our admin costs as well as the additional dollars for Clifford dollars. And I just want to jump in here really quick that the increase in admin isn't only attributable to the um, Clifford dollars. The city of Seattle also closed the gap that we had the need for additional um, funding that you saw in a previous um, in a previous presentation. So there was an additional six hundred thousand dollars of general fund that was also allocated to meet our our sort of more not Clifford specific operating needs. And then on top of that, we um, we are there was the additional Clifford funding. Thanks, Meg. So just as Meg mentioned, um, we did receive additional admin dollars from the city of Seattle, and we actually got two um, ads for our admin to help close that gap and to help ensure that we had adequate funding to meet our operations and admin costs. So the first line right here is COVID mitigation dollars. These dollars are going to support to continue the COVID um, response here within the city of Seattle and the King County um, region. Um, also, we received $800,000 in King County, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, in admin dollars from the city of Seattle. And then we have a line for maintaining current programs. This $19 million is including the Clifford dollars that were previously mentioned on the slide um, for the $26 million. And these dollars I would like to highlight are multi-year dollars that will help to fund the Soto and Cairo Enhanced Shelter. Um, the next line will be for tiny house villages and non-congregate alternative spaces. And this will be for new capacity. The next line um, under council budget ads is a one-time provider appreciation pay. These dollars um, are not currently included in our budget because we are in the process of amending our MSA with the city of Seattle to include these dollars. So they will be added to our budget at a later date and then presented to you at that time. We received a council budget ad for safe parking, council budget ad for admin costs that Meg just mentioned as well for $600,000. We are expanding programs with our council ads and maintaining current programs with our council ads. And we also would like to highlight that um, the city of Seattle council members did approve and award $5 million for the high acuity enhanced shelter. It will go directly to King County this year and then will transfer to the regional authority in future years. During our meeting with the implementation board, we did discuss the use of provisos as well as earmarks. Um, they went through a discussion um, policy-wise on how to handle provisos and earmarks. And um, within that discussion, it was in, within the letter that you guys received um, stated that they are approved to move forward with these um, budget actions. And um, I would like to go through some of what these provisos are so that you're aware of them as well. The first proviso is an $800,000 proviso of the $3.6 million from our COVID mitigation dollars for us to continue to use those funds with um, youth engagement centers. Um, and then the next proviso is $10.7 million from the city of Seattle where we are um, ensuring that we are using those base dollars for tiny house villages. 
I would like to note that all of the provisos and earmarks will have no budget impact for this uh, regional authority because we are already intending to use and are intending to use um, these dollars um, with their intent and purpose they came to us from the city of Seattle. This is just a breakdown with the language to this $800,000 proviso for youth care. And this is the proviso language for the $10.7 million for the tiny house villages. Next are our earmarks. These are also known as our such as languages. This is where um, language is stated for us to use dollars for um, particular providers and they are mentioned in a such as phrase. And so these three earmarks are for Scofflaw Mitigation, God's Little Acre and Lehigh for Camp Second Chance. And for the uh, Scofflaw Mitigation, this is $185,000 for us to maintain our outreach and parking offense mitigation program with them. The next one for the God's Little Acre is for $100,000 to expand homelessness day, service, day center services and $980,000 for Camp Second Chance, which is the expansion of that village, I believe for 20 um, tiny houses and behavior health support services, as well as the additional operating costs to support these, uh, these expansions and these new units that are going into that village. And then as previously, these are as well, these as well will be the breakdowns of each of those earmarks. And this is the last earmark for God's Little Acre. And then this one is the earmark for Camp Second Chance um, with Lehigh, where it is notating that it is expanding the village by 20 tiny house villages and providing the operating costs for these villages, for this village and its expansion. And at this time, I will turn it over to Mark for um, approval of the budget and approval of the action taken by the implementation board for our budget. Um, it will require a two thirds vote. And if you have any questions, we can also answer those questions for you. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, briefly, I'd like to read just into the record, the letter that you all received from uh, co-chairs uh, Odom and Reddy. Uh, it reads to the KCRIJ governing committee, as the chairs of the KCRJ Implementation Board and with the unanimous endorsement of the Implementation Board, we are recommending approval of the budget being presented to you on January 13th, 2022. We recognize that this budget was developed later than what will be the usual process because CEO Doan started in April, 2021 and the startup and hiring process takes time. Our board plans to engage early with RHA staff on the budget for 2023. We also want to note that the Implementation Board had a robust discussion of earmarks and provisos at our December 8th, 2021 meeting, as well as some discussion at our January 12th, 2022 meeting. While we recommend approval of this year's budget inclusive of the City of Seattle's earmarks and provisos, going forward, we will work with city and county funders to minimize the use of directed funds, better aligning with the vision and plans of the authority as an independent agency. In addition, we hope you as a governing board will advocate for additional state and federal resources to support our efforts to end homelessness in King County. Sincerely, co-chairs Harold Odom and Simha Reddy. And Tiffany, I think if you wanna stop sharing your screen, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe I see Councilmember Lewis has a hand. All right, uh, Councilmember Lewis. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for that presentation, uh, Mark and folks at the authority. I, I do have one question just because I, you know, I did see reported today and, and I know Mayor Harrell could speak to this as well, probably, but, you know, it, we, we have a number of exigent encampment situations that the city is working um, to address with urgency. Um, to get folks inside and that, of course, becomes even more acute when we're in a time of year with extreme weather events and extreme um, 
rain and everything else that ex is exposing people to to even more hardship than usual living out in the elements. And I really appreciate the speed with which the authority has moved to um, put together a request for proposals um, that is reflected uh, in this in this budget uh, and getting that work ready in the fall rather than waiting until now. Um, really appreciate that effort to, to move forward on those um, the implementation timelines. I, I know those requests for proposals are going to finish on, on January 28th, and um, I hope that a number of bids have, um, have come in for the consideration of the authority. I, I wonder, moving beyond that, um, if the authority has an idea on the timeline to stand up some of those additional sheltering assets so we can partner as a city to uh, you know, make progress on Woodland Park or make progress on some of the, the encampments um, in the city where we really want to get people into shelter with urgency. Um, and then also just ask how the city can be a partner in speeding that along uh, in terms of the implementation once bidders are selected in terms of, um, you know, things that are kind of outside of the, you know, the four corners of our budget conversation, but things that involve, you know, SEPA review or zoning or everything else. And just wanted to pose some of those um, questions of once we approve this budget today, when we pivot to, to the next phase of, you know, turning the budget, the numbers on a sheet into tangible assets, the authority can operate. Um, do we have a sense at this point on timeline from, from this vote today to when we, we might see at least this uh, RFP that's closing on the 28th um, physically be on the ground? Uh, thank you, Council Member. I believe as um, we discussed over the course of the fall, um, that uh, bid will close on the 29th and uh, review is on my calendar because uh, I wanted to be on the authority's first RFP review committee um, is on the 4th of February. So we're moving really rapidly on that. Um, we are bound appropriately um, by an equity-based procurement process. And, uh, you know, I think as we know, right, in thinking through equitable deployment of resources, we want to make sure that we aren't simply activating um, the well-worn path, so to speak, right? And um, I think our, our colleagues at the Lived Experience Coalition participated really robustly um, in the strategy development for that RFP, um, are participating in the review, um, and we're really grateful for um, their, you know, just, you know, again, very robust and, and um, supportive engagement of our staff uh, as we uh, seek to do things differently. Um, I will say, Right now, and I just want to be really clear about this, um, the thing that is uh, the most significant barrier to new anything is staffing. It isn't the stuff, it's the staffing. Um, we have uh, in our current uh, portfolio, um, you know, either eyes on property or, you know, movements forward on property, you know, and things that transitioned over to us. Um, that I, I don't know how they will be staffed and, and nor do, do the providers to be clear, right? Like um, in order to get through um, what we hope is the peak of the surge um, in the next uh, week, we have developed a, a pooled staffing infrastructure across our largest providers so that as people get sick or go out or resign, um, that we are able to detail staff from other agencies in order to keep shelters from having to close. Um, we have had shelters operate uh, overnight shifts with a single person, um, which is simply not advisable. Um, so, you know, I, I, I want us to be really clear eyed um, that the path to resolving our homelessness crisis, um, you know, I, I said this yesterday at the uh, regional policy uh, committee, um, is you know this is a this is a system, but it's people, right? Like this this is people helping people, um, and if we are not able as a community to prioritize uh, living wages um, and you know really robust support for the for the frontline staff. Um, then uh, that will remain the, the barrier to, to opening new things. Um, so, you know, I think 
uh, structurally, right, in terms of the processing of an RFP and, you know, the, the uh, you know, movement forward on, on that particular project, I would anticipate um, that, you know, bids will, or that, you know, awards will be made on those bids um, by like the second, third week of, of February, um, which depending then on, you know, sort of siting, right, things could open um, either immediately or if there's some development need, I think we'll have to suss that out with whoever the, uh, uh, you know, awarded bidder is. But the broader question of like, what are we going to do really sits inside, um, you know, a, a policy question for appropriators at the state level uh, and across our region for how are we going to invest in our workforce and stabilize it. Mr. Chair, I believe I see Council Member Herbold. Thank you. Uh, Herbold? Thank you so much. Um, on the topic of um, workforce investments, I want to highlight um, that in addition to the city providing a uh, one time cost of living bump to 5.8% this year, we also uh, approve funding for a wage equity study for human services providers that will compare the pay scale not to other human service workers across the country, but will examine the skills and competencies and responsibility level of the work they're doing. Um, and compare it to comparable work, not again, not just focused on other human services workers, but that the type of work that they're doing. Um, and so I, I know HSD is working hard to uh, find a partner to um, perform, perform this uh, really important study. Um, also wanna just um, on the topic of any house villages, um, wanna point out the funding that is provided in this budget um, is for an expansion of um, an existing tiny house village in, in West Seattle called Camp Second Chance. Um, and uh, this is, I, I think, uh, something that hopefully we could look at doing um, rapidly because there's already there's already a location, there's, there's, there are no siting issues. But I also wanna flag separately from the funds um, provided to RHA for the expansion, we also, um, provided funding in the city budget uh, to get access um, to, uh, to, to water and hygiene facilities. This is, um, I, I believe, the only city supported tiny house village without plumbing. Um, and so the we're providing to RHA funding for the expansion of the village and services. And then separately, the city is um, providing funding to finally, they've been there for, for five years, finally uh, get some plumbing out there. So just wanted to make sure folks were aware of that. Um, the only thing I would add, Mr. Chair, to Council Member Herbold's uh, remarks is I've been to Camp Second Chance and I don't think there's, I don't think, so for the existing things that we are level funding or expanding, there should be no delay there, right? Because it's just as fast as people execute and then we move forward. Um, so the, um, the uh, and because we are broadly not, we're not doing anything new other than with the, the new money, right? Like, so anything that is, expansion or level funding moves out as soon as the PSA is in, in place. Thank you, Council Member Herbal, for the comments and Mark for that clarification. Are there any other questions or comments regarding the budget? Uh, uh, Council Member Balducci. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It's a question um, and I'm positive that we have been briefed previously, so I apologize if it's repetitive. But um, I see the different earmarks and provisos and what we would call expenditure restrictions. I think we've got different terminology for the same things in our different governments. Um, from the city of Seattle's budget process, King County also went through a mid-biennial budget process late last year and included some directive funding. The one that uh, comes to my mind is, I think there was an ad for 800,000 to a million dollars for a tiny, homes. Um, and is there a reason that that doesn't show up separately? Is it because we're still directing to our own? 
Department of Community and Human Services. Okay, I see the nod. Thank you. Yes. Um, and and just for everyone's uh, symmetry, um, Leo and I have uh, talked. I'm sorry, Director Flora and I have uh, spoken extensively about um, the. Uh, transition timeline of those things, acknowledging that they will come to the authority because it is shelter, right? Um, but that where uh, DCHS is in process already, it does not make sense for us to interrupt their procurement cycle, yep. like, you know, break everything apart, take it and then restart it. That all makes sense. I just wanted to understand where the different budget items resided because we're still in this transitional period. So that makes perfect sense. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Balducci. Any other comments uh, from the board? All right, going once, twice. All right, so we're now gonna take this to vote. Uh, should we do a roll call on this particular item or just a, a collective? Mr. Chair, it is required for a vote of this type that we do a roll call vote. Excellent. Um, and uh, my understanding is that having closed uh, this section, uh, the, the parliamentary rules would indicate that you would uh, call for any formal discussion. Uh, yes. If there were none, then we would move to a roll call vote and Naomi can facilitate that. Thank you, Mark. All right, so do we have a motion to approve this budget? This is um, member Bernie. I move to approve the budget for 2020. Thank you, Mayor Bernie. And Member, do we have Backus. A second? Member Backus, I second. Thank you, Mayor Backus. All right, let's open it up for discussion. Any further discussion? All right, with there being no further discussion, Naomi, do you mind taking it to roll call? Thank you, Lamont. Dow Constantine. Hi. Joe McDermott. Hi. Claudia Balducci. Aye. Lamont Green as the designated alternate to Jonathan Hemphill. Aye. Kirk McLean. Aye. Zanita Reed. Aye. Angela Burney. Aye. Ed Prince. Aye. Nancy Backus. Aye. Andrew Lewis. Yes. Bruce Harrell. Aye. Lisa Herbold. Yes. 12 yeas, zero nays, and zero abstentions. The All budget right. Thank you, Naomi. So the, it is unanimous and the uh, 2022 budget for King County Regional Homeless Authority is approved. Excellent. All right, so let's move to severe weather and COVID updates I'm turning it over to Mark and Meg. Thank you again. Um, and uh, yay, sorry, I just have to say. What's a big deal? <laughs> like, I, uh, uh, it, there were days this day felt very far away uh, in April. So, so it is exciting that we're here. Um, okay, um, this presentation on severe weather was originally uh, supposed to be delivered by uh, Alexis, our sub-regional planning manager. Um, she is actually um, off doing her job in sub-regional planning uh, with some of our uh, North King County colleagues. And so I will be uh, delivering it. Um, Naomi, would you mind running the slides? Thank you. Is everyone able to see that? Yes, thank you, Mark. Wonderful. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our uh, landscape um, is uh, across, I'm, I'm largely focused on the region, I'll speak a little bit about Seattle specifically, um, but across the county we have our existing emergency shelters, our existing emergency shelters with expanded capacity, uh, warming centers, and then public spaces that functioned as warming centers such as King County Library locations, city halls, and community centers. Uh, next slide. Um, this is the geographic distribution of that. Uh, and what you can see on this slide is that the, um, let me just make sure that my key is right. Yep. So the red uh, dots that you're seeing are uh, new severe weather uh, locations that were opened during the incident. The dark blue are expanded capacity. 
The dark green are King County Library locations and the orange are warming centers. Um, I wanna give a special shout out here to the King County Library System, which um, their leadership was uh, exceptional over the course of the incident. And uh, we really look forward to continuing to partner with them. Um, their uh, orientation towards uh, helping people get in from the, the lethal temperatures um, was greatly appreciated. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, so in terms of space by the numbers, um, in Seattle, there were six sites um, and uh, the uh, South King County had 12, East had seven, two say parking programs using hotels and two cities offering hotel vouchers directly. North King County had three sites and one city offering hotel vouchers and Snoqualmie Valley had one site. Next slide. Throughout the event, um, we had uh, 27 sites um, about 19 different provider operators uh, and uh, total capacity when fully activated was uh, over 900 uh, beds or rooms. And uh, in terms of severe weather shelter capacity that was added during the incident, we added at least 260 additional uh, beds or rooms. I will say that our data limitation here is on uh, the number of folks who were vouchered into hotels directly by cities or other agencies during the course of the incident, uh, which we do not have uh, access to. Uh, the incident lasted uh, roughly 10 days. Um, between uh, the 23rd and the 25th, we had 21 sites operating, five severe weather sites and expansions activated. 26 to the 29th, 27, six severe weather sites and expansions act activated. And then from the 30th to the uh, first, we had a slow deactivation uh, with 22 sites operating on the final day. Um, this is the, uh, 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 sorry, the next slide. Sorry, you were going, so I just kept talking. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, this is uh, the graph that represents the um, available units and unit occupancy um, over the course of the event. As you can see, we maintained more available units than were utilized. Um, I wanna be clear that is not something that means that we did uh, you know, all that we needed to do. Um, we uh, have some lessons learned that I will, I will speak to shortly. Um, in terms of support throughout the event, um, uh, Alexis did daily sub-regional calls uh, and coordination with city partners, providers, and advocates and faith-based partners across the region, along with her team. Um, uh, Paul Tan, who uh, is the South County uh, coordinator at one point, drove like 200 meals to places. Um, as Council Member uh, Lewis mentioned, I, uh, along with uh, Interim uh, HSC Director Tanya Kim, staffed a, uh, a shelter on, on the Monday of, of the uh, final day. Um, and so we really tried to, to just be helpful <laughs> uh, and coordinate as much as we could. Um, we uh, really worked to think about how we could activate food, transit, um, and delivery of material. That was, uh, those were some of our primary uh, uh, focal points over the course of the incident. Um, and here's uh, some of our lessons learned and, and uh, challenges. So uh, transportation was a significant challenge throughout the incident. Um, we uh, had a number um, of, uh, as you all know, with the snow, we had a number of, uh, you know, local and county uh, transit uh, agencies unable to do what they would normally do, which meant as a result that for many of our unhoused uh, neighbors, getting to things became very difficult. We uh, were able to coordinate uh, some lift vouchers that we dispersed, you know, essentially when people asked for them. I will say, you know, one uh, clear lesson learned, and I mentioned this uh, again to the Regional Policy Committee yesterday, uh, the vouchers that we received were for $30, but then once the surge pricing was in effect during the incident, the trips started to range more towards $100, $130, right? Um, and so we need to be clearer when we're negotiating that kind of uh, uh, thing with our um, non-government transit partners in advance that we must be anticipating that surge pricing uh, as opposed to just when we would take a normal uh, trip across town. Food and meal access um, was a uh, was difficult um, across a number of locations. 
Uh, again, shout out to uh, our staff here uh, who drove meals to places and, and shout out to uh, the Fair Start team um, that helped provide some of that food. Um, but we want to make sure that we are doing a better job of anticipating that need. Um, holiday weekend, limited available indoor uh, day space. So, you know, I think um, we saw uh, consistently that the, um, you know, things were just closed because it was like the new year or Christmas weekend or, you know, and, and so I think we'll want to do some more significant planning around what we, what we will do when inevitably an incident occurs on or around a holiday again. Um, we, uh, you know, continue to see staffing issues uh, as a uh, result of, you know, the broad sort of resignation issues that our field has faced uh, over the last two years. And then uh, a number of uh, shelters, um, we had to, as I mentioned before, work really hard to support their staffing um, because of COVID exposures and folks um, uh, having to quarantine. And so I think, you know, we're just going to be in that situation uh, for a while. Um, in terms of next steps, so we're gonna uh, debrief with um, all of our uh, sub-regional partners. Um, we uh, are gonna work on improved communication and coordination and planning with uh, public health, uh, King County Metro and other transportation uh, and city emergency management offices. Um, we were uh, really solidly integrated into the city of Seattle OEM structure. Um, and uh, that, that was a, a really significant uh, boon. And so I, I wanna uh, also lift up the work of, of Curry uh, and her team over at Seattle Office of Emergency Management who really did an exceptional job. Um, and uh, I, I wanna be really uh, you know, clear again, right? So there was a moment where, where quite literally the authority was not in charge of the system. And then it was January 1st and we were in charge of the system. And it was during a severe weather event layered into a, a COVID surge. And so I, I, I really wanna lift up just the incredible um, get it done energy of all of the folks who uh, worked with us uh, to support people. Um, we need to think about how we um, reconnect with newly activated sites and support them uh, for their participation for the rest of the season, uh, learn from where a newly activated site or sites were not uh, appropriately staffed or didn't have the right resources and make sure that they get what they need moving forward, um, and then identify strategies to support and grow our workforce and volunteer base. Um, the last thing I would say that isn't on this slide uh, before uh, turning it back to you, Mr. Chair, and, and any questions from the committee um, is just that, you know, one of the big lessons, I think, for us um, uh, was that we, uh, at, at the system level, ha don't have the adequate planning in place to support people who choose to or need to shelter in place during weather incidents. Um, much of our severe weather shelter that opens does not have storage, is not attached to broader service arrays. And so people, um, you know, uh, in my mind, frankly, very justifiably are making the very appropriate decision not to potentially lose all of their life's possessions um, to go into a place for a single night, right, where they're going to have to leave in the morning and there's no service structure around them. Um, so we need to do better uh, to really think about how to support people who are living outside um, and need to shelter in place via, you know, uh, it, for, for the remainder of the winter, warming, blankets, food, et cetera. But we also need to have those same kinds of plans in place for when there's another heat dome, when there is smoke. Uh, and I believe increasingly, frankly, when it rains. I think that the rains that we have seen over the last month, um, I believe actually should have qualified some days as a, a severe weather event. Um, so that is the kind of planning that we're going to look to do uh, in the near term. Um, I think you know, our goal is to try to do as much planning, as much collaborative work across the region uh, in advance of an, ine an inevitable February event, right? And then to continue to sort of ramp into what we think is the appropriate posture so that by summer, it's a much more well-oiled machine. Um, and that's what I have on our severe weather response and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mark, for, for that very important and life-saving work. Uh, is there anyone from the board that has any, I see Mayor Bernie? Thank you so much. Um, I only wanted to say thank you so much for your work in coordinating all of this. And I mentioned that in the Regional Policy Committee yesterday as well. Um, 
I know every time we have an event, um, there are people out there who have been coordinating in, in all different aspects of this work. But um, I really, it was really apparent to me um, how well you and your team did in trying to bring all of the different um, entities together to really um, make sure people are safe. So I just want to say thank you. I know there's a lot more work to do, as you mentioned, but um, for me, it was um, a very different experience um, as this event unfolded, how much coordination there was um, and how much um, communication there was. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bernie. Uh, Council Member Herbal. Thank you. Um, in the uh, beginning of your remarks, Mark, um, you mentioned um, the leadership of the King County Library System. And I'm wondering, could you talk a little bit more to that? I'm very interested to learn um, more about your experiences with the King County Library System. Um, we had uh, staffing difficulties with the Seattle City Library System. Um, COVID related, understandable um, staffing shortages of library staff, but um, my understanding is when we offered um, to staff some of the libraries with uh, city staff who are accepting a voluntary reassignment during the, store, the, the, the storm, um, the city library system declined those um, those voluntary staffers for that purpose, and just would would love to um, to learn a little bit more about your experience with the King County system. Certainly, Council Member. I obviously can't speak to the specifics of anything that happened with the the uh, Seattle system, but um, our experience of working with the King County system is, and and their leadership. I believe I first spoke to their executive director in um, gosh. October or November, um, and we had a really good call uh, and conversation about um, their willingness uh, to acknowledge that they were in many uh, spaces, right, the default place where folks experiencing homelessness spent their days, right, um, to avoid weather, to access computers, to read a book. <laughs> um, and uh, because of that, um, they were really interested uh, from the beginning in figuring out how to partner with the authority um, and, you know, how we could think about, you know, uh, being innovative about, you know, providing uh, service delivery, right, through some of those library sites and, and to, you know, enrich the, the space so that folks are coming in to use a computer and maybe also getting connected with someone who can support them on a path to housing, right? Um, obviously, none of that has come to fruition yet. Um, but, um, you know, when uh, the incident began, um, our team was able to, to reach out to them and really quickly, um, you know, sort of ask whether or not they would be willing to be listed in our resource list and whether or not, you know, they would be willing to, you know, keep us updated on their closures and what would be available. Um, and, and they were just incredibly helpful um, and, and very supportive um, of, uh, you know, trying to be open, trying to be available. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I believe, you know, that, that that saved somebody's life somewhere. Thank you. And just another quick follow-up. Um, as it relates to geographic distribution of um, winter response shelters, I'd love to just hear a little bit about your thinking um, about that. Typically, Seattle has done a very centralized approach, um, and West Seattle, given um, our bridge being out, um, is um, uh, having some special challenges, but just generally, even before the bridge went out, I, I, I feel it makes sense to have more locations where people are, and we know that there are people living unsheltered throughout our city um, and just would be interested to learn a little bit about your thinking about that as well. Yeah, I agree. I think we need to do a, a better job of um, uh, both within Seattle Metro and across the region, making sure that there are accessible points during severe weather incidents. Um, uh, as I believe you know, we were able to uh, partner to get uh, something open in West Seattle that was volunteer staffed. 
you know, this is one of the lessons to learn from, right? In terms of like, you know, how much support, what was, you know, uh, what was communicated, et cetera. I, I, I know that our team uh, worked as hard as they could to support that um, location over the course of the incident. I also know that there were some difficulties there. And as I think you all know, like I'm never afraid of admitting that a thing didn't perform perfectly. Um, to me, that is an opportunity to learn um, and uh, to do better, right? Um, I will say that our North Seattle locations trended um, at, you know, between zero and 3% occupancy for the duration of the incident. And I don't know what that means yet, to be honest. I don't know if it's that people were not aware of them, that it did not, you know, it, it was not an appealing uh, location for whatever reason, right? So I think that we need to do a better job uh, in coordination with the lived experience coalition and our other, um, you know, outreach staff and, and unsheltered neighbors to understand where we can put stuff that will will do a better job. Um, the downtown and particularly city hall trended at near a 90% occupancy rate for the duration of the incident. My belief is that because it is a known, like it's, it's almost always open, right? Um, and it is very centrally located from a transit perspective. And, and we always maintain, right? Because it's the core city government, we always maintain something that's gonna get you there pretty much, right? And the last thing I'll say is, regionally, um, I'm uh, very concerned uh, predominantly about our, our Southeast King County region. Um, you know, as you uh, heard, uh, Snoqualmie Valley had, had one, one shelter, right? Um, uh, they need um, a lot more of our directed resourcing. Um, it is not, I wanna be very clear, it's not an unwillingness. It is not that they are, you know, you know, trying to say like, oh, we don't want any of these things here. Um, it is, you know, it is that they have not received um, a significant amount of resourcing in order to stand things up. In fact, uh, the uh, single shelter that operates in Snoqualmie Valley um, was only a winter shelter until COVID hit and then it switched to being year round. And so we are going to be really focused on uh, helping that Southeast subregion stand up more of that infrastructure. Excellent, thank you. Any other comments regarding uh, severe weather updates? Yeah, this is Kirk McLean. I'd like to ask a question of Mark. Uh, Mark, with regard to the severe weather uh, this winter, um, I I know, well, I don't know, but I have uh, known in the past and I've gotten information that there are a number of, number of people who actually pass away during this time simply because of the the weather being the main function. Um, and these are folks usually not located near uh, shelters. They're not located near the downtown areas. Most, most, most of the time they're out in the uh, suburban type areas. Uh, what kind of a response does, do, uh, do you have? What, what kind of resources can you, uh, were you able to uh, uh, apply to folks who weren't able to come to you, come to the centers, come to where the help was? Uh, were you able to, to, to provide any outreach uh, uh, folks uh, to get out and see where people were and give them information or maybe even give them a ride to somewhere that they could find uh, shelter out of the uh, winter cold this, 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 this last time? Yeah. Um, that's a, a really great question. So um, we process two emergency uh, work orders, which are it's just a mechanism to disperse funds. Um, two emergency work orders, one actually uh, to uh, the LEC, which then worked um, to uh, do harm reduction work with unsheltered folks. Um, and I, I believe um, Lamont and Zanita uh, helped lead some of that work and can speak to that directly. I won't, I won't uh, step on that for them. Uh, we also processed a work order to uh, U Heights um, in order to uh, support uh, a focus on folks who are in vehicles um, to get them uh, access to, you know, blankets, warmers, food, et cetera. Um, uh, so we, those were our two mechanisms that we use this time. And again, I think it's really important that we be clear that like we can do better than that. And we just need to plan in order to make that happen. Um, you know, the other thing that I'll say is uh, the um, uh, HOPE team uh, system navigator staff, uh, Dwight and Carly and those folks um, were uh, consistently in the Seattle metro area trying to make contact with folks to try to get them uh, rides to places. Um, and it, it was uh, uh, their team 
and the you know sort of broad array of outreach providers that really lifted up about two days into the incident, people don't want to move, and we need to you know retool what we're doing, um, which then led to the emergency processing of those work orders. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, thank the, um, you, Mark, and the regional authority for those funds to be able to help unsheltered folks get into hotels um, and things like that during that time. And I did see some of those navigators coming to, I was helping out in, in Lake City at GLA volunteering there so they could be open. And there were some folks coming through to see if people needed rides to shelter and things like that. So I think that's a really good um, idea and things, but I just know there, I, I did have some folks who didn't want to leave their cars, didn't want to leave their vehicles, you know, so um, us just making sure that we're much more prepared, you know, and ahead of time and, you know, getting those resources to folks before it starts getting like that, you know, um, when we know, you know, just like maybe three to four or five days before making sure those resources are getting out to folks, you know, especially like food, like make meal kits or something when you're in your car, you know, there's no place to cook or anything like that. So I had somebody who I was trying to get to and, you know, so thank you for those resources though, but. Thank you, Zanita. Any other comments regarding severe weather updates? All right, wow, we, uh, we're way ahead of schedule. That's, that's a good thing. But before we leave and before we adjourn, um, as we all know, Monday, uh, this upcoming Monday is Martin Luther King Day. And Dr. King continues to be a beacon for racial and social justice, equality and peace you know, throughout the world. And the King County government's logo of Dr. King's image is symbolic of those same values that King County strives to embody such as racial equity, inclusion, diversity, and excellence. So this Martin Luther King Day and every day, the Lived Experience Coalition, we ask that we, the people of King County, have greater compassion and respect for our unhoused neighbors. Dr. King once said, quote, too often being homeless is considered a personal and a moral failing. When, when it's actually a structural and political problem that makes visible the growing inequalities of our society. Too often being homeless is considered a personal and a moral failing when it's actually a structural and political problem that makes visible the growing inequalities of our society, end quote. And we could see that these words still ring true. Dr. King also reminded us that power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love, end quote. I pray that the spirit of Dr. King's vision comes alive in our work to end homelessness. Thank you. Are there any other uh, closing comments for the good of the order before we adjourn? I'd like to say something, Mr. Green. Yes. First of all, may I have permission to borrow the quotes from Dr. King and say them just like you in a few subsequent speeches first? <laughs> Absolutely, Mayor Harold. <laughs> permission from that. That was very inspirational. In, in all seriousness, I just wanted to thank all of you for um, doing this work. I'm, I'm dealt a very good hand is coming to uh, this, this position as a member of your board. I just wanted to thank you. I'm, I'm all in on a regional approach. I want to thank my council members there for making sure that they've allocated money to demonstrate the city of Seattle's commitment to this regional approach. All of you are doing just outstanding work. Uh, I'm all in and look forward to being a good teammate and partner uh, as we grapple with the issues we're dealing with. So thank you very much. And sorry I was late, by the way. I have to tell you, I was on a call for this call 
And it kept saying, I'm the only one on the call. I'm the only one on the call. I thought all of you deserted me. I'm waiting for you all. And then they, we had a bad link or something. Sorry, the few minutes late. No problem. Thank you so much, Mayor Harrell. Any other comments for the good of the order before we adjourn? All right. Well, thank you all for your participation today. Our next regular meeting will be on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 2022. Blessings, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a Bye. blessed day.